Welcome everyone, I'm Karen Habercorn and I lead product and customer experience for AWS Identity. I'm really glad to be with you all of today via the Reinforced live stream. Thanks to everyone who's listening and all of the event planners for making this live stream happen when we weren't able to gather in Houston as we wish we could have. I'm sure you'll all agree that this has been an unusual year, unlike any other in our lifetimes that we've navigated and we continue to navigate a global pandemic. It's not a year any of us would have chosen, and it did have tragic consequences for many people. Still, when I look at it through an identity lens, I see something different. I see acceleration. The pandemic forced a lot of us to work differently, shop differently, and just live our lives differently than we ever have before. Let's start with remote work. Many companies had to adjust to a workforce that previously had come into an office and now was working remotely from a wide variety of locations in a wide variety of situations, and they had to make that adjustment extremely quickly. But this created a bunch of new identity questions for them. What does a remote workforce mean for access controls? How do you make sure that a remote employee who might be uh, managing remote school on one, with one hand and trying to do some work with the other hand doesn't actually get things mixed up? How do you onboard new employees who may have never come into the office and make sure that they are the people who you expect them to be and they get the access they need without ever meeting them in person? It wasn't just remote work. It was also the way companies offered goods and services virtually. Many businesses had previously offered in-person services and only, and now they had to pivot to how are they gonna offer online services? There were restaurants accepting online orders for the first time, conferences, including our own conference, reInvent, where previously tens of thousands of people had gathered in person and they were now 100% virtual streaming content. Um, instead of catering to walk-in traffic, retailers had to find a way to reach a wider audience um, so they could actually buy, make sure they were people buying their products when there was no, no foot traffic coming by the front door. This switch brought another set of identity needs. How can new customers sign, on, sign up online for my virtual service? How can I recognize my existing customers and potentially offer them something extra or some kind of loyalty program for staying with me in these challenging times? Whether they called it this or not, what many of these companies were doing was accelerating toward the identity trend of zero trust. Steve mentioned this morning that the, to, when we use the definition we prefer, we see zero trust as security controls around digital assets that do not solely or fundamentally depend on traditional networking controls or network perimeters. Instead, we think the best security is achieved when you blend networking controls with identity-centric controls and get the best of both worlds. Steve mentioned you can augment the security by using them well together. This is what our customers want. They want to be able to operate flexibly in a rapidly changing environment like the one we're living in today. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. How can we get there? How can we get to the right foundation for the business you wanna to run today and in the future? How can AWS Identity help you securely manage your identities, your resources, and your permissions at scale and prepare for that future as it begins to arrive faster than any of us planned? To start with, I just wanna make sure everyone's aware AWS continues to invest. So you know and can know that going forward, you're building on a strong and growing stronger foundation. I see that investment playing out in two ways. The first is just raw scale. Our AWS IAM service handles more than 400 million requests per, per second. That's astonishing scale that gives you confidence to operate your workload securely. The other way I see us strengthening the foundation is just in our breadth of functionality. We, our ongoing feature launches span a broad surface area, everything from extending support for tagging to enable attribute-based access control and more services, to integration with additional AWS services across all of our identity features, not to mention AWS services, but also partner applications, and to introducing more access analysis capabilities, some of which we'll discuss more today. So we'll talk about four key ideas that help you establish your foundation for the future. Structuring your AWS environment, centralizing how you manage your identities, establishing a data perimeter, and then following a journey to least privileged permissions. Then I'll invite two identity specialists to join the conversation and share what they've learned from working with AWS customers on these topics. So let's start with how you set up and structure your AWS environment. The first thing most people do with AWS is they create an account. 
And when you took that first step, you might not have realized that an AWS account has a built-in security boundary. By default, the resources in one account are isolated from another. Of course, for use cases where it makes sense, you can grant cross-account or even public access, but the account itself acts as a security boundary by default. As part of our well-architected framework, we recommend that you separate applications into your own accounts. That lets you take advantage of that built-in security boundary. As you follow that best practice and you increase the number of applications you're operating in the cloud, you'll also establish an increasingly num increasing number of accounts. So to build for future scale, a best practice isn't just to separate applications into their own accounts, but it establish a structure for how your AWS environment is going to group those accounts and enable you to manage them at scale. We've published a white paper and other best practice guidance to help you structure your environment into logical groups that you can manage easily and govern in a logical way. That's where AWS Organizations comes in. AWS Organizations is our man multi-account management and governance service. It helps you operate your AWS environment at scale, even as you implement the security best practices for your applications individually. You get the security benefit of individual accounts, and you still get the benefit of being able to do the central things you need to do in one place. For example, you can turn on Amazon Guard Duty for all of your accounts for threat detection of your entire environment, and sleep well knowing that each time you add a new account for a new application, your organization, that one will also get automatically monitored without you having to take any action. AWS Organizations powers AWS Control Tower, which lets you set up in an AWS environment with a default configuration that follows best practices for multi-account environments. So if you're getting started today, you can get started with those best practices in place. Once you've set up your multi-account environment, Org's features let you govern that environment with security controls and policies. You also get the convenience of being able to manage your environment centrally for provision new accounts, sharing common resources, and even optimizing your costs. Once your environment is in place, the next idea is, that's central to building for the future is centralizing how you manage identities that access that environment. Come As You Are isn't just a song made popular in Seattle's music scene several decades ago, but it's also our identity philosophy. We provide flexibility by enabling you to bring the identities you have or create them natively in AWS. This offers meaningful value to you as an AWS customer because you may be an established business with an existing corporate directory with your employees already, already stored in it. You may have implemented identity management with one of our AWS partners such as Okta, Ping, or OneLogin. Or you may be a new startup looking to create identities so team members can collaborate as they build their first prototype of your great idea. Either way, you can bring those identities and your identities to us, and we'll meet, be able to flexibly meet your needs. This is why we introduced AWS Single Sign-On. That service lets you centrally manage AWS accounts and applications, bring identities from Microsoft Active Directory, your SAML compliant identity provider, or create new identities natively. You can use it for account access if you're managing AWS resources, for application access for the applications your users may want to use for your business, or both. For access to AWS accounts, you manage access centrally, so you ensure your identities get the right permissions to the accounts they need without having to manage permissions in each account individually. That will really help you scale as your environment grows. For applications, several AWS applications integrate with AWS Single Sign-On for identity management, including SageMaker Studio, Honeycode, and Amazon Nimble Studio. Plus, you can use SSO to access standards compliant third-party applications as well. By the way, we've heard that not all existing AWS customers know they can run AWS SSO alongside what you already have in place for identity management. And you can. We just want you to hear that today. You can use it with your existing identity provider, and you can leverage that integration just for easier access control in AWS. You can also use it in parallel with any AWS IAM configuration you may already have. In fact, setting up AWS SSO with an AWS application you want to try is a great way to get started while you leave in place your other access control mechanisms you, are, you already have in place. All right, so now we have a multi-account environment in place. It follows best practices. We set up our identities centrally so that we could access that environment. And now we're ready to talk about governing that environment. A data perimeter may be a new term, but it's not a new concept. Let's consider questions we often hear from customers like you. For example, you may wonder, how do I ensure that my employees have access to my most important company assets and no one else does? Just my employees. You may also worry, 
how can I create preventative guardrails that might prevent that might make sure that only my tr only that can make sure the most important information that f is kept within my environment. I don't want to I don't want to move important information from my corporate environment outside of it. It's questions like these that led us to create a data perimeter. What do we mean by that? Let's dig in. We like to say a data perimeter is a set of preventative guardrails that ensures access to your trusted resources is restricted to trusted identities from your expected network locations. So your trusted resources are resources that belong to your AWS organization. Your S3 buckets, your database, it's where you store your, your company's data. Your trusted identities are the users and roles within your AWS organization who need access to your environment, and your expected network locations might be your data centers and your VPCs. The idea is to distinguish the resources that belong to you from external resources. This is my S3 bucket. That one's not. Maybe it's a bucket that's available to the public that I can access, but it's beyond my perimeter. It's not mine. These users are mine. I configured federation from my corporate directory to roles in my AWS accounts. I don't recognize that user. That's not mine. As we see it, the best security comes from using identity-centric and network-centric controls together in combination, and a data perimeter embodies that approach. AWS already offers several tools to help you compose a data perimeter. First, let's start with service control policies, or SCPs. SCPs are a type of policy that can be applied to your entire multi-account environment, or to a group of accounts in that environment, which is known as an organizational unit, or to specific accounts. They act as constraints on access for your identities, allowing you to establish permission guardrails. You can implement all kinds of permission guardrails with SCPs, not just those that are related to data perimeters. You could restrict with e which EC2 instance types your users can launch to help manage your costs, or you could implement a broad range of security guidelines. In the context of a data perimeter, one way you could think of using them is to prevent users from taking actions such as copying data to SNS topics that aren't part of your AWS environment, distinguishing between acting on your own resources and acting on ones that are not yours. A second tool we offer are VPC endpoint policies. VPC endpoint policies allow you to establish rules around access to resources based on your network. In the context of data perimeter, think about how many employees are working at home right now. As Steve mentioned this morning, there, um, we've seen an increase in the number of uh, employees, not our employees, but employees around the world, who are actually accidentally using personal email for work purposes. Maybe that employee is juggling family needs and just gets distracted. Or you could imagine a developer who's doing work for a corporate project, but also volunteering to improve the website of a local community organization. That's great, but you don't want any of your corporate assets inadvertently ending up in the wrong place. When you set up your network to funnel traffic through your VPC, you can easily set data perimeter rules for the identities you centrally manage. You can make sure that developer keeps his corporate projects and volunteer work separate. Security teams might also imagine versions of the scenario that have more malicious intent. For those scenarios, you can go further and implement rules like this one. Prevent users from outside of my organization from moving my customer data through this VPC endpoint to an S3 bucket that I don't know own. Finally, resource-based policies. Resource-based policies are attached to specific AWS resources to specify rules around accessing that resource. In the context of data perimeters, they let you prevent access by identities that are not associated with your AWS environment while still ensuring AWS services that you use to operate your applications can continue to access those resources when needed. You might implement a rule like this one, which prevents identities from outside your environment from accessing an Amazon SQS queue, while also allowing AWS services that need to access that queue to continue to do so. We continue to enhance data perimeter, data perimeter tools. For example, we recently simplified how you can maintain access for AWS services when implementing identity or network perimeter rules. And there's more to come as we continue to invest in simplifying how you can manage permissions in AWS. So now we have your environment in place, central management for your identities, and a data perimeter to enforce secure access scenarios. The final step I want to talk about is following a journey to least privilege, which Steve mentioned this morning as a best practice. To go into a little more detail, least privilege is the security best practice of granting only the permissions needed for an application to function or a user to accomplish their tasks, nothing more. 
By making sure permissions aren't overly broad, you ensure that identities can only take the actions you intended. Sometimes customers tell us they want to implement least privileged policies at the very start of a project or their, or their relationship with AWS. But we prefer to see least privilege as a journey. Developers rarely know what permissions they need at the beginning of a, a, a project when they're building a new application. They might want to prototype different implementations to see which is most performant for their use case. To do so, they'll need permissions for all their design options initially, but then they'll whittle them down their needs as they go and learn which ones work better or which ones are less effective for their use case. So trying to achieve least privilege when your requirements are uncertain could end up stifling innovation and it could turn your security team into a bottleneck as developers uncover additional requirements or opportunities. Our guest this morning from HBO Max mentioned that in their organization, it's critical that they're able to innovate as quickly as possible. And so having a guardrails in place allows them to take managed risk because they know the guardrails in place from their data perimeter, give them the opportunity to then uh, winnow their permissions down over time as their workloads mature. We see this as a cycle. You start by setting permissions that cover the range of potential needs. Perhaps you might adopt one of the policies we offer in our managed policy library as a first step. Then you verify those permissions grant your intended access. And then as the workload settles, you refine your permissions to remove any unnecessary access that you have now understand more deeply you no longer need. Then continue the cycle as your applications evolve, achieving least privilege over time. This year, we have introduced several capabilities that help you simplify your practices at every phase of the cycle that I want to talk about in a little more depth. Let's start with the first step, setting permissions. In April, we took a step towards setting permissions for you we, with our vision to fully automate how you set permissions over time. With our new policy generator, you can develop an application and then test it for several days, executing all of its functions in your testing. And then you can generate a policy based on that access activity that was captured in your logs while you were testing. That, our policy generator captures the actual actions your application performed for many AWS services and then provides templates for, to further refine your permissions. In honor of Reinforce, this week we're actually we're extending the number of services that you can generate policy for at that action level, level, level of detail. I think this step toward permissions automation is super exciting. Just last week, we extended this feature to work with logs you centralize in your organization. And we look forward to your feedback as we further automate permissions management. As Steve mentioned this morning, we also simplified setting permissions by introducing policy validation. Policy validation evaluates your policies and performs more than 100 checks of everything from syntax to best practices. That validation provides actionable recommendations that you can use to address findings and improve your policies. Um, Steve mentioned it's built into our visual editing tools, so you can actually resolve findings while you work, making sure that you're correcting the issues at the root cause before, they, before you deploy your policies. You can also access its findings via API if you have your own policy workflow and want to be able to catch potential opportunities to improve them as you, as you work offline. For the verify stage, we already offer a powerful tool, Access Analyzer. It uses provable security, an approach that uses a form of mathematical logic called automated reasoning to evaluate all access paths to your critical resources, even those which have never been used by anyone. Access Analyzer lets you verify that existing access meets your intent. And it integrates with Security Hub so you can see all those findings alongside those from other sources. Earlier this year, we extended it in a way that I think is a game changer. Detective controls are critical to security, but now you can use Access Analyzer as a preventative control as well. You can check what access will be granted by a policy before you've deployed your changes. This lets you verify that proposed public and cross-account permissions for critical resources, including S3 buckets, KMS keys, and secrets manager secrets, removing unintended access before it reaches production. Finally, for the refine step. We provide data about when AWS services were last used to help you identify opportunities to tighten your permissions. Earlier this year, we began providing more granular data about the actions used within those services for EC2, IAM, and Lambda, in addition to the S3 management actions data we began providing earlier. With this information, you can compare the permissions granted with when they were last accessed and identify opportunities to further refine your permissions. This is an area where we continue to invest to simplify your journey to least privilege. 
In fact, as we look toward the future, we envision an increasingly automated permissions lifecycle, and we look forward to your feedback about how we can help you achieve that. So now I want to extend this conversation by involving several of our identity specialists. Coming up next, Bridget Johnson and Jesse Fuchs will join me to talk about what they hear from customers about these trends and topics. Welcome back. I'm excited to welcome Bridget Johnson and Jesse Fuchs as we talk a little bit more about identity topics. Bridget and Jesse, can you start by introducing yourselves and telling everyone what you do at AWS? Bridget, we'll start with you. Awesome. Welcome, everyone. My name is Bridget Johnson. I'm a senior software development manager here in AWS Identity, and I own Access Analyzer, uh, something Karen just talked a lot about. So thank you for doing that. Hey, everyone. Uh, Jesse Fuchs. I'm an identity specialist solutions architect. So I get the opportunity to work with a lot of customers of different sizes and various industries and help them solve identity challenges that they run into. So excited to be here. For those of you who don't know Bridget, her horse Pickles often plays a role in the policies she discusses. So make sure you check her out on Twitter so you can give her ideas of what, what applications Pickles might need to play a role in next. All right, well, let's start talking about the trends we mentioned today. Um, have either of you noticed any changes in how our customers are prioritizing or focusing because of the pandemic? Yeah, I'll, I'll start. Uh, I don't have a direct experience, but uh, my office mate, Sarah, who owns uh, product management for Cognito, which is our consumer identity service, um, she was working closely because at as maybe most of you know, is uh, reInvent went from something that was in Vegas. We could all be there in person, and like you said, tens of thousands of people. Uh, it actually went virtual, and that means it was available worldwide. And, and those individuals had to sign up, they had to register, they had to explore sessions. And so uh, with Cognito, they were able to work and scale and serve that. So that was an interesting take on what needed to be done um, during, the, during this last you know, year um, to change. Yeah, a lot of companies had to change how they operated, not just AWS, and Cognito could play a critical role there by enabling them to sign up and, and allow their users to sign into their whatever virtual services they were offering, whether yeah. it was online exercise or a, <laughs> or a corporate event. Yeah, and also, like, I heard stories from coworkers all over AWS about them helping customers, and it was really inspiring to hear that we could be there for that. That's awesome. Jesse, how about you? Yeah, working with a lot of customers, the, uh, the pandemic really uh, you know, forced customers to reinvent features, applications, and, and sometimes big parts of their business. And as part of that kind of rapid reinvention, uh, we, we saw a lot of uh, interesting identity challenges, um, to, such as like touchless experiences. And one that kind of comes to mind is the Coca-Cola company. And so they actually launched um, a touchless drink dispenser so it was offering consumers a safer way to um, order a drink with various flavors. Awesome. Yeah, and the way it worked is like you'd go up with your mobile app, you'd scan a QR code, and then choose the flavors you want from your mobile device versus actually interacting with the, the um, drink dispenser. And so you know, they were able to do that within 100 days from prototyping to production. And one of the core pieces of that was solving uh, identity and access management challenges with how the mobile app actually interacted with the, um, the drink dispenser, which was interesting. That's a really great example of taking a business model that existed for a long time and then reinventing how it would work to give customers more confidence to use it in the pandemic. Thanks for sharing that. Awesome. 
All right, well, let, let's move on to the second trend we talked about. What have you heard from customers about zero trust architectures and how they're thinking about implementing data perimeters? We'll start with you, Jesse. All right, sure. Yeah, I, so I've, I've uh, talked with a number of customers about improving the security posture of their microservices. So they're really interested in um, basically overlaying identity-centric controls um, for their microservices. So complementing those with their network controls to form these um, data perimeters, these stronger data perimeters for their microservices uh, in an attempt to really mitigate risks associated with uh, freeform lateral, lateral movement between services. Um, and they've done that in a variety of ways using uh, bear tokens, JSON web tokens, mutual TLS. Uh, but I've seen a lot of customers actually prefer uh, also looking into native integrations such as Amazon API Gateway, where they're able to uh, leverage the same protocol that we use for authentication and authorization for our APIs for their own APIs. That's really a great point. The customers don't want to assume anymore that just because both of their microservices are operating in the same network, that, the, that it, that's just enough for them to talk to each other. Having that identity-centric con control gives them an extra layer of security. Exactly. Yeah, I, uh, I actually had a really interesting conversation about uh, data perimeters in uh, 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 and, and what they said was, they said, you want to tie the networking control to the resource control to the IAM control. And I thought that was a really good summary of a word you use, blend, in your presentation. Was it's, it's not just one thing anymore. It's really all of these blending together to first create that holistic data perimeter around everything in your organization. And then over time, it's going to happen where you have like specific OUs or other things where maybe all your production accounts or maybe some service that's really critical that you want a, a, a tightened uh, data perimeter on. And so it's a more holistic approach with using all of the controls together in one. Um, and one thing that I see as a trend is that customers are wanting to make universal statements, like what can always be true um, about their environment, their AWS environment. And so they'll want things like no one outside my organization can access data within the organization. And, and so we're, we're looking at more of these controls where it is a universal statement, one of them being um, block public access uh, with S3 is a great one where you can turn on block public access, you can use an SCP to make sure no one can turn it off, and that really provides you a lot of confidence about who can access that data, make sure it's not public. Yeah, one of the great things about customers who are starting off today, if they start with AWS Control Tower, is it has built-in guardrails yeah. that have some of these invariants that we've heard from so many customers are important, like turn on S3 block pu public access. You know, you may have an individual application you need to make an exception for, but the default rule, you know, secure by default yeah. is the principle here is let's make sure it's just the access is turned off and then I can be thoughtful about what exceptions I make. Exactly. It's a really great point. All right, we also talked about least privilege being a journey. And Bridget, I know My you're super, <laughs> super passionate about this topic given your, given your line of work. Can, can you share what you've seen with customers who are you know, along this journey? What works for them? What are tips to yeah, moving along? Yeah, it's my favorite topic like, like we've talked about before. But I think one thing that's really interesting is, so I've been in the permission space, the AWS permission space, for seven years now. And so I've actually seen the journey of the journey uh, <laughs> to kind of uh, talk about it. But when I first started, we would talk to customers in the central security teams where they were creating all the policies, they were auditing all the policies, they were monitoring, they were doing everything with the policies. And they actually ended up becoming a little bit of a bottleneck because uh, customers were onboarding so many more workloads and they couldn't keep up with the number of policies for applications for humans that needed to be to be created and, and uh, kind of uh, put out the door. And so what ended up happening was they needed to delegate that to developers to create those policies for, with those fine-grained permissions. They didn't know all the ins and outs, but developers did. But we all know developers, they like to move fast. They like to maybe do things and have some broad permissions and, and explore and whatnot. But then how do you get them back to fine grain? How do you get them on that path? And so um, one thing I've noticed with customers is when you talk about, OK, we need to set up some guardrails. Like, what are the rules that everyone in our organization needs to play by? We all need some rules every now and then, right? And so um, that's where I find customers who are successful look for common things. What do we know to be true across all of our environments? And they try to bubble those up to guardrails or, or restricting access using service control policies or some other things. Um, that sets up that sort of data perimeter. Yeah. So now they've got these guardrails in place, they can feel like, okay, now I can 
continue on the journey. With yeah, them. and then so that allows them to continue on that journey. And then what I found really successful is customers actually embrace that it is a journey, right? And they, they start with one thing. They're like, okay, we're going to add some checks right before deployment or right before promotion from development to production. Um, and Or they're like, okay, this is one thing we really care about. We're going to look at that. We're going to monitor it. Um, and they, they iterate through it. And I've seen some customers go through this process and come up with real holistic solutions that empower the developers to build and have fine grain permissions. So everyone uh, can kind of be happy at the end of the day. Yeah, that's really awesome. Yeah. How do you see them using Access Analyzer specifically in that journey? You know, are they reviewing their findings and sort of yeah, incorporating that? Yeah, I think it, that in? it's, it's at the, it's, it's at the stage of, of, of all the places that you mentioned in your talk. And what we saw is a lot of, in original, is like more reactive, right? We're going to go through all our policies and look at our findings, or we're going to go through all our policies and run the validator. And what I'm hearing from customers, that trend is, we want to move that sooner. We want to move it closer to what when uh, engineers are building, when they're crafting, and really pulling that uh, permission posture earlier on. Um, and that's, you know, they're incorporating, uh, I think you're going to talk about the, the validator into pipelines and whatnot. So uh, I think that that's something that I see moving closer to earlier in the development life cycle. Well, since you set up Jesse, tell, yeah, us, yeah. Oh, tell, tell us about putting the policy validator in pipeline. Yeah, uh, I guess where I see customers being successful is when they're really intentionable, intentional, intentional about their uh, policy life cycles. So you'd mentioned like set, um, verify and refine. Mm -hmm. So when they're intentional in using uh, some of the capabilities and features and services that we offer, that's really meant to streamline the journey to lease coverage. So you'd mentioned the um, the IM validator. So as you're authoring a policy, now there's a hundred best practices checks related to security best practices, errors, looking for things like invalid actions um, that they can leverage when building policies through the console. But we're also seeing customers start to uh, embed those controls in their built pipeline. So if they have policy authoring uh, systems like you had mentioned before for deploying out their policies, being intentional about embedding those controls into the pipeline is where they're, where they're kind of moving there. And I think not only are customers using it, but we internally as service teams are actually using it as well. I don't, I don't know if you can speak to that. We t yeah, we totally are. <laughs> when we launched the policy validator, one of the things we told, told all of you is that we actually used it on our managed policy library. We wanted to make sure that the policies that we were publishing met all the security guidelines that are best practices that we were sharing with you. Um, since then, we've begun to ask, what other assets can we make sure ha meet our higher security bar? And the next one we've been tackling is documentation. Bridget, you know, tell us a little about that. We just kicked it off. Yeah, we just kicked it off. And so we're actually um, working with our AWS documentation team to use the policy validator uh, to, to raise the bar on our policies and make sure they follow security best practices and are uh, kind of error free. And so you'll start seeing changes come out. Yeah, I definitely think this is a great example where the you know we're all using the same root, root cause res resolver to improve our security, and I think that means that we can continue to find more ideas for checks we can add. Yeah, I was actually going to make a plug for it. <laughs> um, uh, we actually get our checks from all over. We we talk with security experts, we talk with customers, uh, internal teams, external teams, partners, and so if you have an idea for a security check, um, let us know uh, either on Twitter or console feedback or, or through your account manager. Um, but you can get us the idea, and we'll consider it for future checks because we keep adding them. Yeah, one thing that was great to see earlier this year is you actually added a couple of new checks specifically related to how people use tagging in yeah, their policies. and conditions. Because we, we, heard, we heard about situations where customers were not quite sure how to get their tagging controls right, and this helped them detect when they were potentially using one that yep. might not have the effect they expected. And so that was a great ex example of an idea coming in and you sort of turning around and saying, how can we add checks around that to help customers be more successful with that strategy? Yeah, that's been super fun. And new ideas coming out all day, so all the time, so it's great. Yeah, and, and as a solutions architect, we're also actually using the policy validator to validate some of the policies that we create for proof of concepts and things like that. So um, That's great to see, too, because I know that customers take the solutions that the solution architect community publishes and then use them as a foundation for applications they might build or the use cases they have. And so now that means they're going to start off on a stronger foundation because we're double checking those policies, too, to make sure they adhere to best practices. That's, yeah. a, that's a cool example. I do want to talk a little bit about the policy generation step because this is like a you change your mindset when you generate a policy because instead of just saying okay I started with this policy what do I remove from it right 
it's sort of a different way of thinking about how do you accomplish or achieve least privilege over time. Well, how, how do either of you think about that? Well, I think about it as really uh, complementing kind of the, the story that you were telling, right, is you might start broad, right, because you don't know what you need yet. And then as your application matures or you finalize, then you're going to say, okay, I'm good here. And you're going to let it run for a while, and then you can go to Access Analyzer and uh, generate a policy, and it actually guides you through. It'll it'll uh, analyze. Access Analyzer analyzes. It's kind of fun. Um, and <laughs> uh, go through CloudTrail, your CloudTrail activity, figure out what you use, and then uh, recommend a policy for you. And one of my favorite features, actually, one customer pointed out about the policy generator is um, it actually calls out where you can uh, specify even further fine grain with a resource, right? So say like put your bucket here or or some other uh, resources and it will match the actions. And so I think that helps with that education too of helping developers get to that right fine grain permission um, in the development stages before they go up to production. It sort of creates a built-in workflow. Yep. Like first, let's look at the actions that the application took. Yep. And then let's figure out how can we restrict those actions just to the resources that we need to, the application yeah. needs to act on to then have the least privileged permissions that that application needs. Yeah. And, um, you know, everyone loves action level permissions. And so we, we're, we're adding more this week, which I'm excited about as well. So we keep improving and iterating on that, on that product. Is that some, have you seen customers starting to experiment with policy generation yet? Um, yeah, I've seen customers start to experiment with it. And so prior to that, you were always evaluating CloudTrail logs and having to set up kind of your own automation. And so now we're moving towards this model where Access Analyzer is going to do a lot of that work for you. So you can just allow it to tune the permissions for your application, application execution roles um, so that you can streamline that experience to that, that journey to least privilege. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Hey, Bridget, I mentioned that uh, we, you actually extended this feature last week for yeah. organization trails. Can you talk a little bit about that use case and what it opens up? Uh, yeah, so as of last week, um, you can point, uh, when you ask Access Analyzer to analyze and generate a policy for you, you can point it to uh, your organization trail. So that's usually in a central account somewhere uh, where it's collecting all the logs from all the accounts. And uh, that's a security best practice. Uh, and so you can grant Access Analyzer read access, and it will go to that and, and uh, generate a policy for you from your member account to that central trail. Um, and I think uh, that enabled a lot of use cases because that's how a lot of enterprises were setting up their, their cloud trail. Yeah, I thought that was really important because yeah. we do recommend that. Like if you, you know, if you use organizations integration with CloudTrail, what it does is says, let's collect all the yep. logs for all the accounts in your organization into a, central, into a central place and ensure that all the accounts maintain logging so that you can gather that data with confidence. And with that, you know, so you, now you're saying you can use that best practice with, with this least privilege tool and you, and you can actually use them together, yeah. Which, yeah. I think is, which I think is pretty powerful. Yeah, I was going to say another trend related to that policy lifecycle was more towards the refinement of policies. And so mm -hmm. when we talk about intentional um, uh, policy lifecycle, it's setting up sprints so you're actually evaluating your policies. And, and one kind of trend I've been seeing is customers using AWS single sign-on. Mm -hmm. So they're using mm -hmm. permission sets, which you can think of, it's a, it's a concept within AWS SSO that's basically a role definition. So mm -hmm. it's the template for the roles that you're going to deploy. And they use that and do an assignment to an AWS account. And then AWS SSO takes the heavy lifting of deploying the roles into those downstream accounts. So when it comes to refactoring and using some of these services to really understand which permissions are being used, they can go and refactor within their permission set that they're maybe reusing across uh, a number of AWS accounts. And so it pushes kind of that heavy lifting onto the AWS single sign-on service. Yeah, that's a great example of the benefit you get from using AWS single sign-on. Because you're doing your access management centrally, if you discover an opportunity to refine a policy, what you're saying is you can update it once centrally and then have that propagate to all the accounts where that, where that permission is in the permission set is in use. And so it saves you the effort of having to figure out where am I using this or how many accounts do I need to update this in. I think that's a, I think that's a really great example. I think the last thing that I wanted to ask about with uh, least privilege came a little bit from what Steve was talking about this morning. He said you should always be verifying your permissions on some kind of cycle. You know, do you, how do you see customers do that? You know, verifying, you know, establishing a cycle. You, you've mentioned like having some kind of sprint or practice. What's what's a good way to accomplish that? Yeah, I, I think it depends on if the permissions are for your applications, so your execution roles versus human users. So 
as your application changes over time, you add new features to it. Uh, updating your policies, verifying your policies along the way is a great way of keeping up on ensuring your permissions are at least privileged. And then we got into tuning with the actual policy generation. And then when it comes to your um, human users and the policies for your human roles, um, scheduling that refactoring and using some of the services available to you is a really important thing. So as your operating model changes, you're able to shift your policies um, with it so that you're able to take that journey to least privilege. Yeah, I think one of the steps that I sometimes hear customers doing is looking across the, the roles they've set up for their human users and just asking, do we need these anymore? Yeah. Are there roles that are just completely unused that are part of my security surface area that I can just reduce what I have to review by saying, you know, this particular role just doesn't have a purpose anymore. It hasn't been used in a long time. And we actually provide role last used information so you can kind of mm. get some data points on <laughs> when was the last time it's used. I'm sure you can go to my account and see a few, few lingering ones. Um, I, I do, one trend I, I want to call out was essentially, uh, you know, in years prior, a lot of customers were kind of waiting till the end to, to refine those permissions. But as the toolings come up, um, they're kind of uh, delegating more of that permission management to developers. It's really critical to think about what do you want your permission posture to be? What do you want people to know, learn, and implement earlier on in the development life cycle? So it just becomes a part, just like infrastructure provisioning and all of the other um, parts of the development life cycle. So uh, that would be one of the things to think about as you as you move forward. Think about how you can think about permissions earlier in the process versus later, because sometimes it, they could be hard uh, to clean up later on. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Steve was talking this morning about if you start off just granting that payroll admin, uh, ad administrative access, pretty soon that payroll administrator is granting more administrative access, yeah. and a year down the road, you have no idea what's going on, right? So the earlier that you can get into that habit of reviewing and refining, uh, the less the, the less things get out of your control yeah. and create more more opportunity. Yeah. And I like to, that word habit, where it's it's happening often, and it's happening with the same bar. Because then when you raise your bar, it, it's not as as uh, jarring to other folks. Great. Well, let, as we sort of wrap up here, let's zoom out a bit. You know, this whole session is about building for the future. And so I'm just curious, like, what advice would you give customers who are imagining greater scale, more applications, um, as they think about what identity and access controls they can put in place to help them build the right foundation? Go for it. No. Oh, OK. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I think for me, it's, it's really uh, continuous education on the various policy types. And so we have a number of very powerful and flexible policy types that when you put them together, um, you can really scale your permission management. Um, but it's really important to understand what they are, um, how they kind of work together to really get that intended effective permissions based on what you're looking for. Uh, and in some cases, using some of those policy types. So I talked to a lot of customers who aren't yet using service control policies for setting that those, those foundational guardrails and security invariants across their AWS organization. Yeah. Um, I think my, my tip would, would be try to make doing the fine grain Thing as easy as possible, right? Um, and there's a lot of tools out there. There's a lot of uh, services you can use. Um, but really what you want to do is try to make it so it's really easy um, uh, to get to that, that right answer. Um, and so sometimes that's building out templates that are really common for your organization. Uh, sometimes it's generating policies for your applications. Um, sometimes it's just what is the mechanism we're going to have to react and respond and remediate any public or cross-account access that Access Analyzer um, generates a finding for. And so um, just, just having that rigor to, to simplify and iterate through that um, will kind of build it into the culture for future growth and scale. I, I like that iterative, um, small iterative changes can really have a big impact. So yeah. you don't have to do it all at once. Yeah. And I think you're speaking a little bit to looking for opportunities to automate too, right? Yeah. Like, like if, 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 if this has to be a habit that you have to remember, well, our species, we tend to fail at stuff <laughs> like that, right? It works a lot better when you can actually build it into a mechanism or a practice. You know, one of the things you mentioned using AWS single sign-on for the benefit of 
permission sets being managed centrally. Another benefit it offers is that if you have an identity provider like from one of our partners like Okta, you can synchronize your identities automatically to your corporate directory. Yeah. So if someone leaves, leaves your company, well, now your permissions are updated. Someone joins a group, well, now that group is synced with AWS Single Sign-On. That's just an example of another place where you can you know, take advantage of something that will be automated, and you won't have to yourself go in there and figure out, how do I update permissions for this person or, or that person? Yeah. And I think you mentioned in your talk a lot of central controls with AWS organization, right? Like you can turn on CloudTrail and you don't have to worry that it will get turned off. <laughs> um, and I think that the, those are things to, to really streamline and automate that you just don't have to worry about it again. Yeah, absolutely. All right, well, as we wrap up, I'm just curious. This has been fun. Super fun. Doing, doing live streaming, <laughs> but and it's been great hearing both of your perspectives. But what are you most looking forward to the next time we can actually be in person with customers? You know, I'll, I'll go. Um, <laughs> okay. I, I love being in person with customers. Um, it's something that brings a lot of joy. But I think I miss the the moment that after you kind of give your talk about, I'll go permissions because I always talk about permissions, and you walk off stage and a flood of customers come up and they ask questions, they give you their ideas, and these conversations uh, turn into longer conversations and we exchange email and we get on the phone and that's what actually feeds our innovation here at AWS. And I go back for reInvent with a ton of product ideas. Um, it probably annoys my team, but um, you know, no. whatever, why not? Um, and the other thing is, is it actually builds a lot of like long-term friendships. I've, I've gotten to know a lot of uh, frequent attendees at reinforce and reInvent over the years and um, so really looking forward to seeing them again in person and having like deep, deep conversations about permissions and where we're going and, and what should, we should be thinking about because that's wh what drives a lot of our roadmap. Yeah, I think in the meantime, we'd invite all those frequent attendees and those of you who are here for the first time to join the conversation. At, you, know, you can reach us on Twitter at yeah. AWS Identity. Uh, you can s send us information you want us to improve in our console feedback. We just look forward to hearing from yeah. you. How about you, Jesse? What do you miss? I mean, for me, it's about the people as well. So those kind of ad hoc, back of the napkin collaboration <laughs> at lunch, um, that's, that's really what it's, what, what it's about for me. And so I've, I found that to be a little harder to do virtually. It is. Um, just randomly meeting people um, from various uh, companies and institutions across the world. So. Right, well, that's, we certainly appreciate everyone who has joined us virtually for this talk and all the other ones today. And we look forward to having the opportunity to engage with you in person in the future. And in the meantime, electronically, in whatever way works best for you, please join us and give us your feedback. Thanks a lot. <laughs>